All right, Robert, will it be the best September we've seen in a while in real estate or will it be a crash, burn, prices dropping, recession 2024 is the end of the year when real estate all of a sudden just implodes on all of us. What will it be, Robert? Best September in a while and best month in a while. Of course, real estate haters will not like that. On this episode oh, no, of Real Estate it's Chat, just too much pandering and too much too much pushing our own our own horn or something or other. But yeah, no, we sell that's... we sell cars too and insurance and mortgages on this episode of Real Estate Chat with Robert Ede and Jonder Press. We're gonna dissect the numbers that came out that we've already dissected a few days ago, of course, with Robert's projections, make sure you click like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We're also going to do something special, which is address our viewer comments, both the good, bad and ugly, as they say. Yes, we are real estate brokers. We don't sell cars. We are not used car sales. We sell resale homes. We sell whatever that you want to buy. For those of you who have just joined our channel, watch from episode one. Our push has always been do what's best for you, do what's right for you. Don't listen to what two guys in the real estate industry have to say. Do your own research independent of what we say, because that's what the smart thing to do is. And we're not trying to sell anything. We're just trying to share with you what's happening in the real estate market. We're being as transparent as can be. And at the end of the show, you decide. And if you love us, you hate us, you love real estate, you hate real estate, we love to hear from everybody. So comments will go through a... Comments round in the end, and we're going to address some of the ones we've received recently. But first, let's start with transparency. What is happening in the real estate market? Robert, take us away with the actual numbers after your projected numbers in our previous episode. Well, August came through as lousy, which we were already knowing it was going to be as lousy. The 25th best August, and it was uh, a little bit less than the same month last year. And, uh, you know, August is never amazing. Normally the exhibition gets in the way. This month was distinctly a first half and a second half. The second half, notwithstanding the normal exhibition, all of a sudden got good. Now, all you got is bottom feeders who are nipping off the cheapest properties in every price class, be it a condominium townhouse complex or detached houses in Don Valley Village, the lowest ones, the best deals, the guy who's most compelled, the vacant homeowner, they're getting the action. So we move on to regular people once we get rid of the uh, the bargain hunters. So you're going to find out why it's also the best month ever, because Robert just said it was lousy, but it was also the best month. We're going to find out. Stay tuned for that. Actually, maybe here it is. Well, it turned out that even though I was only off by $20,000, it's the third highest August because all of the Augusts were bunched in together. You can see them there where the, the big, I had to make the star bigger so that it would show better. They're all bunched in there about the same, but you can also see where it converges and then goes up again. So part of my enthusiasm for the September at the outset is that sales will increase, not tremendously, but uh, modestly, and that prices will not fall and will go up compared to the previous month, compared to the previous year, and follow the trend that we've identified right above. There's a 2024 following annual seasonal pattern. I do believe that is doing it. So you can see where we're going next. So why uh, why will that happen? Because some of the naysayers, some of the haters, some of the ones that believe that real estate shouldn't be this lofty, despite the fact that it is. I mean, it's mathematical, really, when you're looking at average prices, because it depends on what's the prices of the homes being sold. So Robert, What's the rationale behind why would why would prices go up in September, even though we obviously see that it does go up every year anyway? Why this year? Okay, because interest rates have just come down. And the big thing is that now everyone believes in interest rates are going to continue to go down. Maybe another half, maybe another three quarters. And people have been talking about more than that by the middle or end of next year. And that makes the monthly payments lower. What we've seen throughout this uh, whole episode where we've been 35% off the number of sales is the people on the sidelines, the first time buyers and uh, the specs, there's no spec buyers. Uh, only the most interested person has been participating. Only the most interested seller who's maybe owned it for 20 years, they're in the money. Um, I lost my train of traffic. Why is it going to go up? It's going to go up because now consumer confidence has turned a corner. And everybody has to live somewhere, 
which is a slogan that's going to be on a t-shirt available very, very soon. And so they're saying, what am I waiting for? Prices are not falling off a cliff. We're already 19.49% uh, off the peak. So I've got 20% of the 33% that the worst case scenario was envisioning. Um, what am I waiting for? I don't want to live where I'm living. I want to move. And so people have been on the sidelines for six months, for 12 months. Now they're not. They're moving. All right. So remember and take note, if you're watching this, take note of some of these key points, as many of you commenters are, which is good. We love the engagement because we will touch on some of these a bit later. But for now, let's look at the months of active inventory because uh, the, num the level of inventory has always been a story for the past couple of months, especially the loftier, more recent levels of inventory. So what are we looking at now, Robert, in terms of okay, months of inventory? We active use inventory? months because we don't trust the new listings. We don't trust anything except for the ratio of sales to inventory. And we're up still at over five, uh, over four, 455, which is the highest it's been in a little while. If you look back, we have to go way, way back to the bad times in 08, 09 to get to four months. So um, we got to clear out a lot of inventory, a lot of that inventory. Trust me, every buyer who is out there looking knows that there's 25 or so of those properties that are for sale should not be for sale. They either have a tenant in there that's impossible to get rid of. It's in terrible condition. Nobody wants it. It's got some sort of a nuisance factor. It backs on the 401. It backs onto a plaza. It's got like somebody bought it and now they're trying to get rid of it. And they're, they're just not a greater fool at this time because the inventory supply is so great. So they'll rent them. They'll sell it to somebody. They'll reduce the price. The inventory will go down. But right now we've got a good number. It's buyer's market territory for inventory. We'll look and at this later. And that's another reason why prices are not uh, dropping as we all are all expecting or anticipating or wishing and hoping they are. Now, let's look at this uh, phenomenon here that you that many of our real estate chat viewers who have not uh, seen this before may not be finding this anywhere else and the reason why for that. So what is a realist? What's Why is this impactful to the inventory level numbers being reported by the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, Robert? Okay, the only reason to watch this channel, Real Estate Chat with John and myself, is because everybody else seems to be oblivious to what I pushed Jason Mercer to finally put out. Put an acknowledgement that the terminate and realist phenomenon, which is a strategy for listing agents, which means it's now been defined by the board. If somebody has a property and they terminate the listing and relist it again, the same property, the same owner, the same broker within the same original time frame as that first listing, it's called a relist. And they count it on this chart, which is buried. You have to know where to look in order to get it. It comes out every month, every district. And they calculate that based on the total number of listings, which some of these properties are terminated and rested two or three times in the course of a month, certainly two or three times in the course of a, of a, a 60 or 90 day listing. And so they count them. And on here, it's saying for the overall 29.5% of the new listings are repeats, which means that they're really only 70% of those that are new listings. The rest of them are repeats. They're do-overs. They shouldn't count. But we think that having a great supply of listings is a good thing. So they're, they're not telling the truth about the net number of listings. They're letting this listing strategy of terminate and relist because it doesn't cost anything to do that what you get you think you're doing is you get to run it through the system again as a brand new listing maybe you can fool somebody into thinking that it's a new property it's a new listing the board maintains well it's now it's being present priced differently it's being presented differently it's a new listing it's a new thing i say to them oh yeah how many times can it be sold because if it can only be bought once then it's only one listing don't double count it Correct. You do yeah. the math the other way around, you'll see that we're actually at 41.77. 41.77 of the net listings, 88.50 this month, are do-overs. That's a lot. Even 30% is a lot, but they won't acknowledge it. Anyway, so this is the table from the board. It comes out every month about noon. The rest of it comes out at 5 o'clock in the morning and breaks down how everybody is doing in every district all across the all the zones that belong to the Toronto Real Estate's reporting area. And this is the official chart. We now take it and do something with it. 
Okay, I've been watching them all, breaking it down into different zones, and some are high and some are low, and what's the average, and who cares? The thing is, everybody's doing it, just like the reported one there by the board. But that goes by month. This is by, by zone. And then we put it into a chart where you can look at it and say, oh, what's the impact of this? How many really are being uh, relisted? I know it says 30%. I know it says 26%. What does that really mean? So we go to the next chart and we see two lines. The blue line is what's reported. The red line is after you subtract the relists, what you get. Now, the two dotted lines going through the middle are the five-year average and the 10-year average. One is 12,700 and something. The other is 12,400 and something. It's about the same. The current number of listings, 12,547, is being presented as being 1.15% above the long-term average. So very normal. The unfortunate thing is we spoke about this before that there many of them are duplicates. They're do-overs. They're not new. They're repeats. The actual number of new listings at 8850 is 28.65% below the average. So there's actually a scarcity. And when you have a scarcity, prices don't go down. Well, there you go. And I, I mean, going back to it, let's exaggerate here a little bit. If one property relisted, terminate relisted 10 times, that's 10 listings that it would count as. So you can imagine if several of them are doing that, maybe not 10 times, but even one or two times in that same month, which again, that's pretty ridiculous to happen, but there's where the exaggeration lies. And this would be a much uh, clearer picture. Now let's go to the next chart here, Robert. Everybody in the real estate industry since the very first day I was in, talks about the sales to listing ratio. It's like an absorption rate. It's of the number of listings that are published new this month, how does that stack up to the number of solds? And so you see whether they're building up or is, is the supply decaying, the new replacing, the new not replacing the ones that are sold. And so if we use those same two numbers that we determined before of the new listings, the number, number that's published and net new listings and divide those into uh, the number of sales, we get two different sales to new listing ratios. The <clears throat> red line, the bottom line shows the standard method where every single new listing divided by the number of sales says that 39.65% is the uptake rate. So that that's a buyer's market. The buyer's market break even is somewhere around 40, 45%, depending on who you talk to. So I call it 42 and a half percent. So we're in buyer's territory a little bit. If you subtract out the do-overs and divide that net number, 8850, by the number of sales that we had, then you get 5621 take up rate, which means that it's a balanced market. Now if the real estate board believes, well, the worst part of it is they pass that number along to Canadian Real Estate Association, who adds that into the Canadian, and Toronto's the biggest board of anywhere, the greatest volume. And so it distorts all of the volumes, the new listings and the new sales to new listing ratio all the way across the country. In the last several years, because shelter costs have become such a big thing for the Bank of Canada, if you look on like chart 16 or chart 21 of their quarterly report, the CREA sales to listing ratio is included in their deliberations. It's included in their report. It was as part of the report on housing. So the difference between a buyer's market at 39%, 40%, let's call it being taken up, and a balanced market where more than half are being sold is quite different. A, if you're a seller, and B, if you're a buyer. So how can they both be true? They both can be true based on some dumb math. Oh, you pick. Real Estate Chat viewers, you pick what you feel the market is. Is it a buyer's market? And is it really as bad as the sentiment that's being put out there and reverberated by the media because they're relying on this number is? Or realistically, are we just looking at a balance, which if you're logical, it would make sense because you're seeing sellers who are not quite giving up and dipping down their prices and causing this you know, snowball effect of lower prices, lower sales, even lower prices. So to me, I mean, it makes sense how uh, Robert puts it here, which is more of a balanced market. So moving on, Robert, uh, 
a tale of two different uh, area codes. What's going on with the 416 versus the 905? Okay. First of all, 905 is huge and growing. 416 has finite boundaries. A lot of uh, the sales within 416 are condo. Normally, the ratio is 60% of the sales are in 905. And within the whole area, 60% um, of the house, of the, of the units sold in a month are condominiums. It's different in each uh, of the zones, 416, 905. So we look at them separately. And what we saw from doing that is that they're in different, they're out of phase with each other. We we saw initially, maybe we go to the next one, which I think is, is price. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. Is that the last uh, slide you have there, John? We have another one here for sales, looking at the sales. Oh, okay, sales. Okay, well, sales, are, they're, they're in lockstep. We're going up and down, but they're and they're both 34.67, 35.31 uh, percent off their 10-year average. So they're both off their game. We go to the next one, we see the prices. And this is where it's been trading back and forth. I got a whole bunch of uh, jargon up in the top corner talking about this ratio of 150% of the sales, 64, are uh, in 905. And so when 905's price is higher, it pulls the average up. And if 905 prices, which it was for the longest time, uh, it's lower than it pulls the uh, average price down. In recent years, let's say it's been going up and down, up and up and up and down. Jason Mercer, in his explanation of why uh, prices didn't change, has said there's been a greater number of detached properties selling in 905 than the condominiums in 416. And so that pulled their price up or didn't let it fall as much. Whereas in 416, which is the pinky number, it fell further because the mix of houses in Toronto um, didn't, well, it went down further. Now, compared to the previous month and compared to a year ago, it's not really that bad. The Toronto prices went up compared to a year ago. We see we had a little one-year mark on there. Um, so the, the 905 market is different in that they only have one land transfer tax. And if you're on the cusp of being able to afford something or not, and every bit of down payment that you have makes a difference, because it's sort of five to one ratio of what you have in down payment is what you're going to board. If you can if you can save $20,000 as that extra land transfer tax, that means you can pay $100,000 more by going across the border of steels. Right the border of Etobicoke Creek, the border into Pickering to get away from that extra land transfer tax. Now we can go into whether land transfer tax municipal is good or bad and what revenue it goes into and what's it spent on, what was it supposed to be spent on and shouldn't have been and wasn't and all that stuff. It still happens. It's a factor, just like the stress test. It's an extra cost of acquiring a property and people try and avoid that. You can't avoid the stress test. The stress test was very much important in knocking down the prices, stopping the appreciation, and making it difficult for people to get back into the market. When interest rates went up 5%, 6%, 7% was the first mortgage rate. At 2% of that, it makes it just a little bit more difficult to buy. So <clears throat> this one is it's too small to look at, but I put it in there as the proof source of the ratios now are more like 70-30, freehold to condo and 70 30 905 to 416 so most of the action that we're seeing even though it's still the 25th worst their 25th best market that we've ever seen for sales uh, but prices have stayed up been stabilized and and held up by detached homes at 905 and all we hear in the newspaper if you look at the toronto star is the problems with condos in the city well if they're not selling they don't enter into the math only when they sell do they enter into the math right so what we're going to try to do is because uh, we have uh, commenters that have said how um, complex some of these charts are and they can't see it uh, on the video i'm going to link to it we're going to try to do that from this point onwards just like we used to link to newsletter articles and all that we'll link to these ones now let's do a rapid fire round of viewer comments so we love your comments and uh, you know what uh, again there's no secret agenda no 
sales pitch here. You know, if you have any questions, of course, type it into the chat, comment on it. You can always Google Robert and I if you want to know what uh, we're about. Nothing to hide here. But here's a couple. I mean, uh, first of all, rates are dropping because the economy has fallen off a cliff. Where are jobs that support these housing valuations? We have a surplus of cheap labor. So unless you're packing 10 international students to a house or you have an existing house, then the market is unaffordable. Robert. Okay. If you've already made up your mind, like this gent has, of what's going to happen in the future, then nothing in the world is going to change your mind. We saw earlier on, uh, and I've got it right here, um, affordability crisis uh, would not be solved until there was a 33% decrease in house prices, a 55% increase in incomes, um, and uh, 350 basis points, which is 3.5%, decrease in mortgage interest rates, which was... It was, it was kind of a joke. It was cute. It was, you know, all of the components, the rate of interest, the price and the income. These are the triangle that we talk about, about affordable on our broadcast, Chandra and I. Now, to be again a little more transparent, the whole objective of this broadcast is to show you the truth and present to you a source of the truth. So if you do want to enter into the real estate business as a transactor. You want to be a buyer or a seller or a leaser or a lessor. We'll gladly handle it for you. So we tell you the way it is. You don't have to believe us. That fellow who asked the question, he doesn't have to believe us. I can give him all the facts left, right, and center, and it doesn't matter. He thinks I have a bias. Well, he can have a bias. I can have a bias. I'm not going to call him a name. He just has a bias. That's fair. And we have everything we do here is supported by data. But at the same time, uh, somebody could counter argue that your data is skewed based on what you want. And you know what? Let's go to the next one, which is, you know, yeah. Yeah. Our, our previous episode was apparently this is all crazy talk. We need the interest rates to go to 2% to have any sort of fall activity. No one can afford to get into these large mortgages. Well, in a way, he's right. Um, that's a big word. I wish I could remember his first name in the Financial Post said, we need the five-year fixed rate to get into the threes, which means like 375, 385, at which point all hell will break loose in the real estate market because then, okay, add 2% onto it. You're still, your monthly payment of what you actually have to make is doable if you're in the 375 range. Now, we are half a point, three quarters away from that now. Buyers are anticipating those next half or one point drops in the next 12 months for sure and they're buying based on the assurance from our tiffany macklem that the rates are gone the way down so um yeah he's not wrong two percent let's do it right but fall activity that's a whole different other discussion because like basing it on his okay we're talking about interest rates if you had three million dollars to invest do you want interest rates to go up or go down? You want them to go up. Right. So you got to, in order, it's a balance. It's a, it's Just because you want interest rates to go down because you want to buy a, buy a have a mortgage at a lower rate, somebody else is on the opposite side of that coin. So think about it broadly, not narrowly, not just for your self-interest, Mr. Question. There you go. LOL, the biggest factor in the market is sentiment. And I don't know anyone that's uh, feeling bullish. This is one from this is one from our uh, regular viewers and regular commenters. So this is uh, much appreciated. It has very little to do with rates. So feeling of sentiment. We talked about this in the in the past, right? That rates do consumer have, confidence. Consumer yeah, confidence. Rates tie in with confidence, and this is not wrong either. But uh, is anybody be, uh, feeling bullish? I mean, this is a good point. Is anybody feeling bullish in this market? despite rates are already dropping. So Did why, you go why, to our why? meeting yesterday? In our meeting yesterday, they talked about all of a sudden things are getting hot. Not everything, but only the good stuff. Guess what? The good stuff. We saw 10 years, nearly 25 years of everything selling. Now it's just the good stuff. Well, so in, it's the 25th info. best mar month. It's not hot yet. So insider, insider info, insider info. We said specifically something along the stat of 48% increase in showings in the last part of August, this is to be confirmed. So we'll, we'll pull the stat. Uh, but a surge in the last weeks of August in terms of showings doesn't necessarily will translate to sales, but it gets there. But it also means that people, I mean, the feeling of bullishness, when were people bullish during the pandemic when they drove the prices up? 
after that it went off a cliff? Like when, when do you feel bullish at any point in the cycle? I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, this would have to be more so, are you bullish about your financial situation to the point that you feel you can afford the house based on current rates, right? Uh, several episodes ago, my parents bought when it was the 90s and Robert talks about the 90s all the time. You guys know, you ladies and gentlemen know what the interest rates were like back then and how long prices took to recover. There is a big one. So uh, please provide, well, first of all, he said no completely to the previous episode. Please provide counter arguments for the following. Canadian wages are way out of sync with home prices for the wow. average Canadian household. Mortgage payments as percentage of household income will be around 50% currently. And even with rate decreases will be 40%. Just mortgage alone payments. Well, this is a fella who was caught in the trap of the of the uh, university economist textbook that there's a the Canadian uh, Revenue Agency uh, StatsCan is actually what I'm thinking was StatsCan presents the Canadian public in quintiles twenty percent they have the lowest the second lowest the middle the second from the top and the top quintile twenty percent chunks of the population based on income family income individual income taxes paid benefits received they add it all up and if you add it all up the bottom two quintiles 40 percent of the population cannot ever buy a house so all you're ever talking about as consumers of real estate are the top three quintiles now if you lived in napanee maybe it's different but we're not in napanee we're in metro Toronto. And so it doesn't matter what the average income is. It matters what the income in the top three quintiles, not the people who are on social assistance, not the people that just got out of jail, not the old retired folks who are living on, they have tons of assets, but they don't have an income, but this is based on income. So again, somebody talking from the textbook standpoint is trapped in the textbook. If they can get out and see the world, buy a house, live in it, they'll know what they're talking about. In a textbook, you don't know anything. Well, let's see if this one comes out of the textbook then. Economy, economy is weakening. Unemployment is above 6% and rising. Inflation, while decreasing, is still high. Real GDP growth is negative, skewed by low-skilled, low-productive immigrants. Canadians simply are not saving enough to afford saving for basics, let alone housing. Fears of layoffs are also present. So... This is a 17-year-old who learned that from somebody else. He has no life experience. He has no brain. Because you got to live somewhere. If you're living in your parents' basement because you're 17 or because you're 37 or because you had a house and got divorced and you're 57, and maybe it's a terrible story. Maybe it's the time of life. But all that crap is Statistics Canada. Okay? It's not about life. Life is about how are you doing in your job? Do you feel like the other fellow was saying, I call it consumer confidence. Do you feel like this is a time to improve the quality of your life by getting a better neighborhood, a better school district, more bedrooms, a bigger backyard, a swimming pool, based on the way your life is going right now, the job that you have and the prospects you have for the immediate future? That's all. The, looking at the huge, big, what's the national average for this, that, and the other thing is nonsense. You have to look at, and people buy one house at a time, one purchaser, one seller. It's an individual thing. It's not a group thing. So that's maybe the thing I should have said first. Maybe maybe we thing. should maybe we should be interviewing people who have actually purchased housing or are immigrants <laughs> and working hard and are able to afford housing and don't need to pack as many people into their houses. Who knows? People typically sell their starter condo to upside. So this is all from the same viewer. But, you know, I mean, thank you for your comments because it, it allows us to share transparency, counter argue if, if that's the case, uh, and also shed light. And again, at the end of the day, you don't have to believe us. You know, we're just two real estate brokers. Who knows what we're talking about, right? People typically sell their starter condo to upsize. With Toronto's imminent condo collapse, I mean, sure thing, condo collapse is going to happen. They are selling their condos for much less than anticipated lowering their budget for well, first of all I, don't, I haven't seen that happen yet but anyway prices still seem to be stable but for much less than anticipated lowering their budget for their upsizing home budget so basically they sold much less for their condo they cannot afford the next step all these factors lead to declining home prices again that's not happening 
Like most of the comments suggest rates need to decrease down to 2% or around 2% before it stimulates a real estate price growth again. At the current rate, it is simply foolish to expect prices to go up even though they haven't even sunk. They have like prices have been stable. Prices haven't dropped except seasonally. Robert. I'm going to sympathize crash. with this fella because he couldn't know so much about this situation without being involved in it right now. Sounds like he bought something uh, in late 20. 20 or 2021 and he moved into it with high hopes but it's too small because he bought it from plans and he moves in there and it's just not big enough but he bought with his last nickel and he paid the top price and now he can't get anywhere near that amount of money for it even if he rented he's still leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity and so he's feeling forlorn and he says i can't buy anything else with what my my investment will, 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 I can sell it for. So I feel bad for him. He's forlorn, but he's not a general indication of the whole market. That's just that one particular guy, which is what I said the opposite about five minutes ago. Well, there you go. So thank you for the comments. Keep them coming. Good, bad, ugly. We want to hear everything. We want you to challenge. Uh, this is not a sales channel. This is a real estate chat channel where we chat about real estate we discuss real estate we dissect literally everything to do with real estate and, and gender and we talk about things in a way that nobody else talks about what you hear from the monthly pundits and what you hear from the daily newspapers is a point of view aimed at their readers or aimed at the bank that they work for not we're talking to people who want to buy something are thinking about it want to sell something are thinking about it actual participants and i think you can get that from what i've said in the last two responses to these um you know anonymous comments yeah exactly and uh, do what's right for you uh, since day one do what's right for you do what's within your budget you want to keep renting because that's the best thing to do keep renting you want to buy investment property we share with you what makes sense in this market you want to sell your property we show you how to avoid a crash and burn situation that you know you you retain as much value in your property as possible no matter what the market is you want to buy strategically watch our past videos we talk about doing that as well and also it's always darkest before the dawn so these fellows who wrote the comment a month ago in the middle of the summer it looked pretty bleak on july the 15th it looked pretty bleak everything was bad but that's ancient history well, we're going to see, right, Robert? September, mm -hmm. October, November, December. Real estate chat viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, tell your friends about us. If you don't like us, don't tell anybody about us. Thanks <laughs> for watching this episode of Real Estate Chat. T-shirts coming soon. It'll probably be December by the time we get these out, if we eventually get to it. But uh, lots of things that, that are exciting ahead. So thanks for watching this episode of Real Estate Chat. Take care and bye for now. See you later.